Hey guys, welcome back to One Candle Paranormal Case Files, here with your hosts, Marcus D. And Vic Whaley. And put your snowshoes on, guys, because we're tracking down one of the most bizarre mysteries of the 20th century, the Dietlov Pass Incident. So guys, we are bringing a great episode to you guys today. We are talking about the Dietlov Pass Incident, which nine hikers in Siberia died mysteriously. And we're even more excited to do this because this was a fan request. And we are going to pop that up from Tavon Fenwick. I hope we said that right. Let us know. And we love getting suggestions from you guys. So this is why we are going to do this. And now Vic is going to hit you guys with the history of this incident. The story of the Dietlov Pass is the account of nine experienced hikers attempting to reach the northern Ural Mountains and the unfortunate fate that became of them. On January 1959, the group of eight men and two women, led by Igor Dietlov, of whom the Dietlov Pass would later be named after, set out on this adventurous but ill-fated expedition. On January 28th, one of the members of the team fell ill. This man was Yuri Yudin, and he had to turn back. This was the only member of the expedition to be spared the grisly fate that befell the rest of the team. On February 1st, the group found themselves nearing the slopes of a mountain known by the nearby Mansi tribe as the Mountain of Death. At this point, the group was in good spirits and seemed eager for their journey. The group set up camp, ate a meal, and that night the temperatures dropped down to negative 17 Celsius, around 1 degree Fahrenheit. For reasons as of yet unknown, later in the night, the team decided to cut their way out of their own tent and beat a retreat into the hostile wilderness. The members of the expedition then fell back to the nearby forest and attempted to start a fire even though they were still very near their campsite, and there is even evidence that they attempted to climb some of the nearby great pines, but with little success. Sometime later, Three members of the expedition attempted to make it back to the campsite, but were all found dead within 630 meters of the pine trees. Around the same time, back in the tree line, two of the members of the expedition died from cold, whether this was the catalyst for the previous group leaving, or was a result of waiting for them, is unknown. At this point, the remaining four members of the expedition stripped down the dead and flee an additional 700 meters away from the campsite. In the process, they all either died of internal damage or exposure. The bodies were found about three months later, well preserved by the icy and harsh conditions. An investigation began into what had occurred there, but due to many of the enigmatic anomalies, the investigative group could only conclude that the group was killed by an unknown and compelling force. So guys, this was a bizarre and strange event that happened here in Siberia. So there's no shortage of explanations that people have tried to explain on what happened to these people up there. And we're just going to go through the list and try to talk about what we think could and couldn't have happened. The first one being the Manzi tribe, the native people to the region where the people were found. The nearby Manzi tribe was one of the first suspects that people started pointing to, but the more they looked into it, the more they really didn't think that they had anything to do with it. Primarily, there are no footprints left behind of another attacker, and you know, they may have been somewhat territorial, but they didn't really have much of a motive for this. Beyond that, how did they cause that level of internal damage? Yeah, there was no evidence when they found the bodies of any sort of like, you know, hand-to-hand -hand or human interaction sort of kind of combat that happened between there, and then when that sort of happens, there, there's evidence of it, you know, there's skin under fingernails, there's, a, there's other sorts of evidence around, and they're not finding that when they find the bodies. But interestingly enough, the Manzi do say that some years before this, they had a group of people go missing in this exact same area. And there's even some rumors that perhaps they were attacked by vengeful ghosts of the Manzi tribe. Another possibility that a lot of people bring up is the possibility of a Yeti or Sasquatch attack. Something along those lines, or maybe the native Almas. And this is really cool because this is a one candle first for us. We get to talk about a Sasquatch or a Yeti, Vic. This is awesome. We've never got to talk about this in a video. Yeah, I don't know why we've avoided it up to this point, but we really need to do a full video on it. But one of the neat things that ties it to this is, well, there's some signs that they're trying to sleep out in the open 
about why would you sleep on the side of a mountain when there's a nearby treed area that you could have taken shelter from the storm in. If you think something's following you. Exactly, and that's my thoughts on it as well. And even supposedly there's a piece of paper left behind when they found the bodies that said, and now we know that snowman exists. But similar to the Manzi theory, guys, there's no tracks around making any sort of connection that there was something that large walking around the area. Yeah, I mean, with such a clear set of footprints, you would think a large primate like that would leave some pretty clear tracks. Although, in American Indian folklore, there are legends that they can choose to hide their footprints. But, well, most of the evidence we get from these large creatures, Sasquatch Yeti, are big, notable footprints. And the lack of that, that's a big problem for me. Now, is it big because a Yeti is big, or just that's a big hole in the theory? Oh, my God, Marcus. <laughs> It's big because it's a big hole in the theory. It's M- funny because it was a pun. Moving on. Another theory that people like to bring up is that, well, it could have been an avalanche. And it's the least exciting theory, in my opinion. It really is, and there's not a lot to back it up. Well, a lot of the reconstruction on what happened comes from the fact that there were still footprints around. Well, if there's an avalanche, it's going to bury those footprints. They're just not going to be there. And although we did find some of the bodies buried, and people say, well, then at least they were taken out by an avalanche. Well, we got another problem. They're missing tongues, they're missing eyes. These are signs of scavenging. And well, if they're already buried under ice from when they initially die, those scavengers wouldn't have been able to get to them. More likely, they died, they were picked up by scavengers, and since they were in a ravine, the snow just gathered over them with time. And these guys were experienced hikers. Why would they camp somewhere that they think would have been possibly that they would have ended up in an avalanche? That doesn't even make any sense. But, as we said before, there's some weirdness about where they chose to camp. Alright guys, this next theory gets a little sciency. Is that the hikers up there were driven into a panic by infrasound from a Carmen Vortex Street. So this theory holds that the path that these hikers went through was essentially this perfect storm for a Carmen Vortex Street to form which is pretty much the unsteady separation of flow of a fluid around blunt bodies. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's if you've ever seen a suspended power line dangling and you kind of hear this kind of singing sound, that. So essentially the hikers are hearing now, they're gonna hear a sound. But now this is an infrasound, so they're hearing a sound that's not audible to them. At a certain frequency, this sound can actually cause panic and confusion in people and they don't even know it. Yeah, and this actually makes some sense because the group seems to become most organized when they fall back into the pine trees. Well, those dense pine trees with all the dense pine needles likely create a sound buffer to this effect. And this would be a great theory, but it doesn't explain the internal damage that some of the hikers had. So okay guys, the next theory that we're gonna talk about, kind of getting a little bit more into kind of what I think sort of happened is that the hikers stumbled into a Russian military exercise. This theory holds that when the guys were up there in the past and they had camped up there, that the Russian military was conducting an exercise. And one of the things that happened is they were dropping these essentially called parachute mines that essentially exploded in air, sending this massive concussion wave down. Now, I actually kind of like this because it does explain some of the interesting things about this case. Most specifically, how the internal damage occurred in some of the hikers. So while the hikers are sleeping, the Russian military begins an exercise dropping parachute mines into the area, causing the hikers to freak, running out into the wilderness, leaving many of their supplies behind, running out without shoes. And essentially when they got out there into the woods, they end up dying of hypothermia because they can't make it back to their camp for the rest of their supplies. Another one is UFOs. Well, this area is kind of a hotbed for UFOs. And in the preceding days, well, there are UFOs spotted. There are even some spotted that night, and there are ones sighted afterwards. This just seems to be a thing that happens within this area. Well, we can't really give much backing for this. Outside, there are mysterious orange lights that are consistently reported here. However, we can tie it back a little bit to the possibility of it being UFOs, because there's a few things I want to talk about. More specifically, some of the clothing items that some of the hikers had were irradiated. Now, we've seen in other videos that we've done this connection to UFOs and strange radiation or strange effects from energy. The Nazi bell we've talked about before, and the Flatwood Monster as well. 
We're going to put links to those videos below so you guys can check them out. All right, guys. You've heard the theories that we've talked about. You can even look up other theories because there is no shortage of these things. Now we're going to give you our two cents. We're going to put all these theories together and give you guys what we think happened. Okay, my explanation of what happened. First, we start with why did they pick to, sh to camp on the side of the mountain instead of in the protected tree line? Well, I think in the previous night, they had seen something odd around their camps. Some of these weird glowing lights. And maybe even some forms moving around with them. But either way, they felt that they needed to camp in a place where they could have a lookout point. That's why they camped on the side of the mountain. They got their camp set up, they ate their dinner, they went to bed, and then in the middle of the night they started to see these bright orange lights drifting around their campsite, maybe even with some forms lingering around the entrance. That's why they had to cut their way out of the back of the tent. So they cut their way out of the tent, ran out, saw what was going on, and initially panicked and rallied together heading towards the tree line. Once they got out there, they realized they didn't have the tools to survive, but they also couldn't go back to that weird stuff was going on. That's why someone tried to climb the tree. Scouting out over, they tried to see what was going on. They realized that they really couldn't wait any longer. And three of the most experienced decided to go back and try to get the supplies. On the way back, it just turns out they waited too long and they died to exposure. Because once you get out of that tree line, you're directly in the fall of the snow and you're directly in the wind. And that's why they died so quickly. The people back at the uh, base of the trees, well, they noticed that two other people are dead. They noticed that the three people that left earlier, well, they never came back, so clearly that's not a safe place to go. They had to have known they couldn't have gotten back to that nearby town, but perhaps someone else had noticed what was going on, and perhaps there's support coming. So they stripped down the dead, get all the supplies they can, and they just tried to make it away from whatever danger they ran into. On the way out, I think they ran into something, maybe got hit by a beam, maybe encountered one of these lights, and that caused the concussive damage, and that's what happened to them. We're both in agreement that there was some sort of imminent threat that they felt that they had. But for me, these are experienced hikers and they gotta get out of their tent so quickly that they forget their shoes. In this particular situation, that means seconds matter. So to me, what causes seconds to matter? I think a Russian military exercise is most likely plausible. We know for a fact that they were not intending to camp here. So the Russian government probably is not banking on anybody being in this particular area camping so they're not going to know that there's any real danger to dropping parachute bombs in the area an explosion is an imminent threat that i think would drive an experienced hiker to forget their actual equipment and leave the tent now they're out in the woods they've escaped it but during this time while they were trying to escape some of the people were actually hit by a concussive blast that was caused the internal damage to some of them Military exercises are not a very short thing. Now, they also may not be knowing what particularly is going on, so that's why one of them may be trying to climb the tree in an attempt to see, is the campsite safe for them to go back to? Since it's probably not because of the military exercise going on, that means they're going into damage control mode. That means they're worried about hypothermia, which can set in in 30 minutes. In this particular situation, minutes matter. So now they're going into extreme survival mode. They're building a campfire. They're maybe even going down to some, like stripping their clothes off in an attempt to, you know, to survive these hypothermic conditions. And just over the course of time, they die off one by one. And the Russian government is not a model of transparency. They're probably not going to want the world to know that they accidentally killed some of their own people in a military exercise. And thus, the real reason is never revealed. Hey guys, and thank you for tuning in to our case file on the Dietlov Pass. This was a really intense case, guys, and we had to explore so many different theories. But since we got to explore so many different theories, we got to talk about so many really cool topics. And if you want a part two to this, there's still more that we could even go into. Absolutely. And so this was a fan suggestion. Guys, leave comments below. We love suggestions, and if we like it, we're going to do this video. And if you like this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. But also don't forget, keep believing. Because we'll keep listening.